this was my last really my game next studio physics series. So throughout my throughout this series I tried to make as comprehensive as possible. I tried to cover as much stuff as possible. But um, of course there were a few things I left out for because I didn't think they're important enough or they're too difficult to implement in the tutorial for whatever reason I, I left them out. So I want to take a tutorial to just go over all the miscellaneous stuff that I've missed out on. And so that way so that way you'll know about, about it and so you can honestly tell your friends that you know every single bit of the Game Maker Studio Physics engine. So I think I thought that's uh, important. So that said this can be different from my previous tutorials for in, in a few different ways. First, it's not gonna be a step by step tutorial that you can follow along with. It's going to be just something you're gonna have to watch and try and absorb the information without following along in Game Maker Studio because I'm gonna be throwing a bunch of different examples at you. And for not for another thing, it's gonna be specifically different from my previous tutorial in that my previous tutorial was non planned out at all. And this one is gonna be very planned out. I'm gonna have like every bit of it planned out. I'm gonna record it in multiple sections actually. So it's gonna be far more planned out. So I I think both techniques work work pretty well because with the planned out I can say exactly what I want to tell you, I can make it really precise and get my wording exactly the way I want it. But with the uh, other way, with not non planned out, well, in the previous tutorial I I didn't plan that partly to see if I could do it for for myself to see if I could if I was able to do that. But at the same time, I think that's actually good for you to, to see tutorials in that way because then you can get get a better idea of the debugging process. You can see that I don't know everything inherently. I don't figure it out inherently. I I have to um, go through a trial and error process with with basically everything, in. and it's good for you to see that process. I I think, and you can also you have a better idea of why I put all the code down because I. Uh, I show you in the engine, or I show you in the game, why the next code is necessary every single time, which uh, brings you more into the way I think about it, and will hopefully make you help you to become better programmers. So anyway, I think both both ways have their advantages, and and I uh, will probably keep doing both ways. But I, I'm interested to see what you guys think of one way or the other. If you think one way is confusing, one way is much better than the other, or, or whatever. Uh, I'm interested to see what you guys have to say, so if, if you would please leave a comment telling me about that. So um, now uh, onto this tutorial. So some of you may, some of you may be wondering how uh, people fig figure all this stuff out about Game Studio without there being uh, physics, oh, no, without there being um, tutorials, abundant tutorials available on YouTube or other, elsewhere. Well, there is a documentation built in Game Maker that shows, tells you everything about all the codes in Game Maker. So what I what I did is I referenced that documentation and I went through it and I tried to cover as much of it as possible. So um, let me go ahead and show you the documentation so that I can point out what I still need to cover and and that way you know how to use it well. So let's go into Game Maker and I'll show you that. All right. So in order to find the documentation in Game Maker Studio or any Game Maker really, they ha they have this offer. They have this option in any Game Maker. You go under Help and then Contents, and then I will make the window smaller so you can see it. And here is a table of contents of every piece of the Game Maker code and the engine and everything. So you can see here, there's stuff about the more basic stuff, and then it moves on to more advanced stuff, and so on and so on. Then our reference has just everything listed out. And if you if you want, to, if you're confused about a particular function, you can just go into search and type it in here. Let's see, uh, part system create. Uh, Oh, cannot find search phrase. Let's go under index, which will actually search part system create. There it is. It's right there. I can click it, and then it'll give me a nice description of that particular function. And I'm not sure I'll search different indexes. I guess if you know this function, you go under this one. Oh. Yeah, this is more general, I guess. All right, so but we're interested in going under contents. So this is how I set up the tutorial. I uh, went under the physics section of this so that's reference and then physics and right here is a page everything you need to know about physics so it starts out with an explanation of the physics engine how it's different and I've talked about some of that throughout the tutorials but I would recommend you read it to get more get a bit better idea of how it operates and then for my tutorials when I was designing them I literally went through each one of these sections and tried to make a tutorial about it I talked about forces which included impulse and all that and um, fixtures joints and everything pretty much. So this tutorial is all about looking through all all these functions that this covers and and uh, going over the ones I have not talked about yet. So it's mostly meaning these physics variables. Here, they, these have a lot of variables that are unrelated and 
therefore difficult to make a tutorial about, so it's mostly me in there, but there are a couple of things in uh, fixtures and forces that I've actually left out as well. With that, um, I'll go ahead and start explaining them. Let's go. All right, so to start off with, let's go over the physics world. So just like with fixtures, you can generate the world using code as opposed to doing it in the Game Maker engine. If you don't remember how we generated the physics world, we did so by going into the room and going into the physics tab, and then we said room is a physics world. So I didn't end up uh, talking about how to do it in code because I feel like there's just, there is as much benefit to it as there was to doing fixtures in code. But if you want to do it in code, there's the first two functions, physics world create and physics world gravity, which covers all the stuff that you get you cover doing it in the engine, which is setting up the uh, pixel to meter ratio and also setting up the gravity. And then there's two uh, two functions which are not included, which are uh, physics world update iterations and physics world update speed. So what's important to know is that the physics engine operates apart from the normal world engine. So you have the physics engine operating separately with these settings. So you have the update iterations, which is how often it goes to the physics calculations per step. By making it more, it, the physics will look smoother, and um, but it'll cause more lag. Making it less will make the physics look more jagged, but will cause less lag. So that's a happy medium that you'll have to find how, how much you, you want. The default is 10, but uh, in the documentation it recommends that you say between 5 and 30. So the update speed is basically like the room speed I talked about earlier. It's how many steps per second, basically. So with the iterations and the speed, that determines how much calculations are done or how much work the um, physics thing is doing in the uh, in the game. So that's kind of important to, to realize. All right, so then next there's uh, two um, debug functions. There's the physics uh, draw debug, which we already talked about, which And then the other one is physics world draw debug. The benefit to this is that you don't have to have it in every single object to draw for every object. It'll just draw every single um, debug shape in in the world, in the in the room, I guess, in the system. And this is a, a little more complicated. They have seven settings. They have seven different settings, which are different things that you can turn on depending on what you, what you want to see, what information you're looking for. So you, you can be a whole lot more specific with the world draw debug. And then the last one, the one that the world variable is physics. You can use this to pause and unpause the world because the, the physics world is designed to be paused, but they realize when they're making Game Maker that the pause feature is kind of important. So if you want to ever pause your game, you, you can use physics pause enable. That's one way to do it. All right, so next section I'm going to talk about is the forces section. So I already talked about most stuff in this section. I talked about the uh, uh, impulse, force, local, impulse, local force. But there's one thing I didn't talk about, which is physics apply torque. So I've sort of brushed up on torque a little bit um, throughout my tutorials, but I'll just go ahead and redefine it. Torque is a lot like is like forces in many ways, but it operates rotationally instead of in a particular direction. So for this reason, it is does not have a local or normal because it can only go clockwise or counterclockwise. It's not in a particular direction and doesn't really matter if it's relative to the thing you're rotating or relative to the world. Um, it is defined as torque is equal to force times the distance from the center perpendicular to that force, or it can be defined as the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. And we're going to be talking more about the moment of inertia later in this tutorial, actually. So I think it's r really neat. If you ha One example that uh, where torque can come handy is if you had a vehicle with wheels, you can actually apply torque to the wheels to make the vehicle move, which I think is kind of cool because you're not directly applying a force towards the um, vehicle, yeah, just making the wheels rotate in order to make the vehicle move. Now I'm going to start talking about the fixtures and some of the stuff I left out for that. Uh, again, I talked about almost everything about the fixtures, but there's a few specific things that I left out. So one of them being is fi uh, physics fixture set sensor. Well, whether it's sensor or not is uh, something that you can actually uh, toggle that without using code the, in the in the physics properties section. There's actually a, a box there where, where you can uh, select whether that sensor or, not, sensor or not, and I sort of just ignored it, pretended it didn't exist. It was kind of rude of me, actually. So uh, I'm, now I'm going to go ahead and explain to you what a sensor is. When you make an object a sensor, you're saying you don't want it to be affected by anything physics. So when something collides, it won't do anything. It will, for all intents and purposes, pretend uh, nothing else exists. So you might ask yourself, what's the point of making a physics object if it's not going to work with physics at all? Well, even though it doesn't rotate or move around when you collide stuff, it'll, the, the collision net will still be triggered. So you might want to use that as a sensor to uh, trigger other events. So for, um, for example, if you're playing moving throughout the world, 
Maybe you want something to happen when it collides with this. Maybe you want a cutscene to happen, or maybe you want a secret door to open. Maybe you want that to happen when you reach this area. So you make a sensor in that area where the player could acquire that area and make stuff happen. So you usually make them invisible, but I guess you can make them visible as well. So they're, they're kind of behind the scenes things, behind the scenes objects that trigger other events, I suppose. Okay, so the other thing is physics fixture set kinematic. All right, so um, from my understanding, Game Maker Studio uses the word kinematic and dynamic. From my understanding, they are meaning the same thing by the two. So kinematic is an object that moves around through the world. So at any point in time, it's an object that is static or dynamic. We've talked about static, that's when we set the density to zero, and that's when it's not affected by physics. It, it just sticks there, it's not affected by gravity. Things can collide into it, but it's not going to move. That's what static means. And then dynamic is opposite, when the density is not zero, and dynamic is when it'll, it'll, it'll move around, and it can knock in other stuff and that kind of thing. So kinematic is when, is when it's an object that can be moved around. You um, will want to mess with this if you initially set it to static, but then you plan on it be becoming dynamic later which is something that could happen under certain circumstances. And the, the problem is that if you start out static, it's going to assume it's static, and it's going to make that a setting. And then the process of converting from static to dynamic is memory intensive. So if you go ahead and set it to kinematic, say, say saying you want to be a moving object, it will, it'll go ahead and look at it as if it was going to be a moving object, and then you can save on memory by setting to kinematic from the get-go. One way in which I, would use, I could probably use this is in my game Unheralded, or the game I'm working with, with Odin right now. I can set some objects to static in the beginning, but then when I, when I play a strong enough to move them around, I might set them to uh, I might set them to dynamic to uh, show, show progression in the character and sh show us his powers increase, something like that. So that would be a case when I'd want to use um, physics fixture set kinematic so that it can be changed without worrying about memory loss or uh, the memory intensive process of converting it from static to dy dynamic. Okay, so the last one, last fixture setting I want to talk about is physics fixture set awake. Well, by default, fixtures are set to be awake. So, um, what what it means to be awake or, or sleeping is when when a, let's say when an object is falls down and it goes into the corner and then it's not affected by anything. When it's not affected by anything and there's no reason for it to think it's affected by anything, Game Maker will go ahead and turn it off. It'll turn it to sleep. So that way, it so then it will not it will, won't run any calculations for the object. It'll just save the memory from calculating because it's not nothing's happening happening to it. It'll awake you when something collides with it and makes it have to do rotations and that kind of stuff. So by default, everything's awake so that it can, it can go ahead and be affected by gravity and that sort of thing. But under certain cir circumstances, you might not want to do that because well, for Angry Birds, for one thing, they probably set those all those objects to asleep in the beginning because that way they they won't fall down like because physics can do weird things if you if you let the physics already affect those objects they might just topple over if they're not perfectly balanced so that's why they set them uh, to asleep in that case and other examples in Minecraft with with sand you know Minecraft for gen generates big worlds and having them be awake is more memory intensive because they don't have to worry about physics for all of those different objects so they probably want the want them to all be asleep at least at first, and then wake them up as the player walks close to them. This is probably why sand doesn't fall down when it's first generated. Have you ever been walked into a cave where the ceiling is made of sand, where the ceiling should have been falling down, but they're not because they were generated that way? My theory is that's because they were set to sleep, or something uh, along those lines in Java. That would be the use of a uh, physics fixture set awake. All right, the last section I'm going to talk about is the physics variable section. Under the section, they have several variables that most of them are unrelated, but I'm going to try and make some organization out of the chaos, I guess. Remember that diagram I showed you in the previous tutorial with the uh, different variables in the normal game maker and, the, and how the variables are different in the physics game maker? Yeah. That chart looks something like this. There's a few more variables we can actually add to that. So you have the position or the location variables up top, you know, uh, uh, displacement, velocity, acceleration, and all that. Well, you can go, go through some of this, some similar lines of um, differentiation with the uh, angle actually. So you can have angle, your angular velocity, and then you have the, your uh, angular acceleration. Well, they don't have angular acceleration in Game Maker Studio, but they do have uh, angular velocity, which can be come, come in handy many times. It tells you how fast it's rotating, the change in the angle at any point in time, which you, you it's probably a good idea to set limits on that one, just like we did in the platform with the speed and that kind of stuff, because that way it won't you won't have things rotating crazily out of proportion. Another two variables that I like to talk about are phi speed x and phi speed y. These are very similar to the phi linear velocity x, phi linear velocity y. They're basically the same thing, only different units. Phi linear velocity x, phi linear velocity y are in pixels per second, 
while phi, phi speed x, phi speed y are in pixels per step. If I had used them in the platform material, it would have saved me a lot of trouble with the converting the units. I'd like to point out that for as far as physics goes, the, the way the game maker defines speed and velocity doesn't match up with the way physics defines speed and velocity. The difference between speed and velocity and physics is not simply other different units. Game makers do that as a convenient naming scheme, I guess. In physics, velocity is a vector that indicates both a direction and a magnitude. So a negative velocity means it's going to the, the negative direction and the positive velocity means it's going in the positive direction. Speed is just a magnitude, just a number, it's a constant, it's not a vector, no direction indicated. So you can't actually have negative speed. Speed is how fast you're going at one point in time, regardless of your direction. But that's in the physics world, it's different from Game Maker. I just wanted to point that out real quick. Next two variables I'm going to talk about are really random ones. They don't really have anything to do with anything, they're sort of on their own. And those variables are phi active and phi bullet. Phi active is a lot like um, setting it to be awake or asleep, where if you set it to be active, it uh, goes through physics, physics stuff. But if it's set to not to be active, it's uh, not going through physics stuff. So it's literally a toggle of whether you want physics to act on that particular object or not. And you can toggle it on and off. So it's basically the same thing as, as sleeping for as, for as far as I'm concerned. And you can probably think that there's, I'm sure there's some minute difference, but for the most part, it's just whether or not you want, want physics, physics to affect it. It's just toggle on and off. Do you want physics to affect it or not? Next one is phi bullet. Just like phi active, you can set it to be true or false. You're going to want it set to be true if you have very fast moving objects. So th what it does is it, it has more complex means of collision detection. Because the problem with fast moving objects is if it's saying move, it's if it's moving say let's say 64 pixels per second, then it could then if you check the collision every single step, then it could go through walls for one thing. If you have like a wall that's four, let's say 32 pixels thick. thick and you have a, another block moving 64 pixels per second, then it could, in one step, it could move past that wall and never have a, have a problem colliding with it because the one step, it's not colliding with it. The next step, it's still not colliding with it. It's just literally passed over. But with five bullet, it does a collision detection a little differently. It doesn't only include your current position and the collisions there, but it also includes a collision box. It also includes the distance you covered or the area you covered between the steps. So that's more, that requires more, more memory, more calculations, but if, if you have a fast moving object, it's necessary. So, that's, so you're going to want to put that as true when you have a fast moving object that would require the more advanced calculations. Next we have a series of read only variables. So read only variables are variables that you can only read. You can't actually change the values of them. So these change, the physics engine will change them, but you can't actually change them yourself. So let's go ahead and go through them. Phi com x, phi com y. Com stands for center of mass. You actually can change that with the mass properties. We've already talked about that. But you can find the center of mass using these variables. You can figure out where it is. That's all there is to it. Those are the variables for representing center of mass. Not too tricky there. Then we got phi dynamic. I've already told you that dynamic is opposite of static. Static is where you have an object sitting there, and you just want it to be a block that can't be moved by anything. And then dynamic is is uh, the opposite of that. When whenever it has density that's not zero, it's considered dynamic, it's something that can be pushed around and all that. Then we got phi inertia. We've already talked about that with, that with mass properties, but you can figure out what the inertia is with this vi this variable phi inertia. Phi mass again, pretty much already spoken for. Tells you the mass. I've actually probably I think I've dealt with that already, so I don't even need to talk about that. But yeah, phi mass tells you the mass of the object. Okay, the next is phi sleeping. This one is, um, a, I guess it requires a little more explanation. It, we, we've already went in the fixtures, we set whether it's wake or not. Well, this is the opposite of that. This is whether it's sleeping or not. So if it's sleeping, that means that the engine is ignoring it, it's not colliding with anything, and it's going to keep ignoring it until it glides something. And if it's not sleeping, then it's probably moving around and it's awake. There we go. Lastly, we're going to talk about some variables that are, are involved with the collisions. There are five variables. First one is phi collision points. This is how many points you're colliding with at one point. So if you have an object colliding with two other objects, then it cl phi collision points would be equal to two because there's two points where it's colliding. Next two variables are phi collision x, phi collision y. That's where it's colliding. You may, you may be asking, well, what if there's two collision points and there's multiple values to that? You're right. 
It, these are actually can be represented as arrays. You can use them as arrays, or you can choose not to. Either way, if you want to use them as arrays, you can actually s select which collision points. One will be indexed as zero, and the next one will be indexed as one, two, three, four, and so on and so on. And you can actually create a loop to go through all the collision points and run calculations with them using collision x and collision y. Next two variables are phi collision or phi col normal x, and then phi col normal normal y. So col, of course, stands for collision, and normal is referring to the normal force. In physics, the normal force is the force coming from the object that you're colliding with. When you're on the ground, the ground is emitting a normal force onto you, just simply working against you hitting it, I guess. Normal force is, is the force that an object applies sort of in response to other things. When you're pushing against the wall, the wall is applying normal force back to you. Okay. So in this collision, the phi col normal x and phi col normal y are the x and y components of the normal vector coming from the object that you're colliding with. I'm drawing a diagram here as I'm speaking. Hopefully it's good enough to explain this concept to you because vectors, I, I didn't talk about vectors. Vectors are a confusing thing in and of themselves, but if you want, if you knew so about vectors and you want to find the normal vector, this is how you would do it. All right, next section we're going to talk about is physics mass properties. That's the as a function that we're going to be talking about. This is a function that doesn't adhere to any particular section of the documentation. It's just a sort of a loner on its own. They couldn't really classify it. So I've talked about mass a little bit in terms of how you can uh, calculate the mass based on the density and the area of the sprite. Well, that's that's the top of the um, iceberg, I suppose. There's m much more settings you can talk about in terms of mass and how it can affect uh, physics. One thing being, when you do physics, you do it in terms of the center of mass because that's that's where the uh, that's the point it rotates around. And also, if you have a, a triangle or so, and you try to bounce on your finger, the point where it'll be balanced is at the center of mass. So, as many physics products come in handy, so you can manually change the center of mass to get an idea of, of how it'll change things. Uh, here's a little simulation of how two different objects react with react with uh, different center of masses. As you can see, the one falls down, the other one doesn't because the center of mass, with one of the center of mass is over the edge and with the other one it isn't. So that's center of mass, you can change that if you want. And the other thing is inertia, or moment of inertia, I guess is the technical term, which uh, talks about, which is a value indicating the distribution of mass. So if the, if the mass is distrib distributed farther away from the center of mass, then it will have a high inertia. If it's distributed closer to the center of mass, it will have a lower inertia. So things with high inertia, when, when they're moving around, um, more uh, energy, I guess, is dedicated towards the rotating of it because the higher the inertia, the, the more difficult it is to rotate it. This is why if you are to roll a filled cylinder and then a, a hollow cylinder, if you were to roll them both down a hill, filled cylinder will actually roll faster because it has to dedicate less energy to the rotation. Even though they're both equal mass, and they're the same size, the one with the mass distributed towards the edges will will roll down slower because it has to dedicate more energy towards the rotation. I, I find that quite interesting. All right, then, so that's the end of the tutorial and also the end of the series. Before um, I, I end, the, end the, the whole entire thing, I'd like to uh, just um, talk about one thing. I think physics, physics is very interesting, but in order to learn Game Maker Studio physics, or in order to learn about the physics engine Game Maker Studio, you don't really need to understand physics. I was sort of caught between either making series without any background physics at all, or going going off on on separate tutorials and ma making a many like talking a lot about physics to give you all the background knowledge necessary. So I sort of made a compromise between the two. So as a result, I'm a little bit afraid that I um, turned some people off with, about physics because like the way I went through it was very quickly and just to give you an idea of how the calculations work, not in a way that you can do them yourselves. So I'm afraid that some of you got turned off by it and that you you're you are discouraged that you don't understand it right away and it, it makes sense that you, especially if you if you have no if you, if you've never been exposed to physics before it makes sense that you would understand because I, I went through it way too fast so I I would I would hope that you don't feel alienated by that and if you have an opportunity to take a physics class in the future I'd highly recommend that you you take it because it's it's a very interesting subject and I'm not going to say it's easy but it's it's very interesting and I I think it's really cool to understand have a better understanding how how objects interact in the natural world and if if you even if you want to uh, learn more on YouTube, there's there's plenty of tutorials on YouTube out there to help you learn more about physics. I know for one that Sal Khan has um, a 
tutorial series talking, going, going through all the physics concepts, and I and I plan to also make a series like that in the future. I think that'll be very, very cool. So uh, with that, I'll end this tutorial. Thank you so much for watching. I really, truly appreciate it that you guys 